Et je suis particulièrement heureux d'être ici avec Giovanna Boradori et Richard Cook et qui vont animer cette session. On va en commencer par euh, Giovanna Boradori qui est professeure de philosophie auprès de Vassar College. Elle est spécialiste de la philosophie continentale, de la philosophie de l'architecture et des intersections entre esthétique et politique. Elle a dirigé le record in Metaphysics The New Italian Philosophy. Elle est aussi autrice de deux livres, uh, The American Philosophers, uh, University of Chicago Press, et uh, Philosophy in a Time of Terror, Dialogues with Jürgen Habermas and Jacques Derrida, University of Chicago Press. Uh, ce qu peut, qui peut être considéré un best-seller de la philosophie, qui est apparu en 18 langues différentes. Et parmi ce récent essai, on trouve uh, Tiny Sparks of Contingency on the Aesthetics of Human Rights, consacré à, au statut éthique et politique des photographes des atrocités, et aussi Ungrievable Lives, Global Terror and the Media. Donc, merci Giovanna, you can start your presentation. Ok, my presentation is going to be in English. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, this invitation. Um, I was reflecting upon the fact that I'm the first female speaker. Uh, besides our wonderful, absolutely wonderful moderator, Anna Caterina, thank you for your hospitality. And I was thinking that without any intention to do so, I will actually be speaking about the female angle and um, uh, what the screen of female beauty is, and you can see her on the screen, the ancient goddess Venus, and all sorts of permutations throughout um, European art history, which is of course a politically saturated frame or screen, which will lead me to talk about a um, very interesting and very prominent uh, woman philosopher, Judith Butler, uh, of whom I will, um, um, from whom I will borrow this notion that we can understand screens or frames as politically saturated and um, um, as constitutive really of uh, contemporary political consciousness. So let me start from the beginning. Um, and of course the beginning is Venus. So art historians, credit Titian, whom we see on the, on the screen, with having launched the theme of the toilet of Venus, a private atelier for the production and cultivation of beauty into Renaissance painting. In his 1555, Venus with the mirror, the hands of the goddess replicate the sensuous gesture of modesty of one of Praxiteles' masterpieces, Aphrodite of Midas. The Greek statue is fully naked and Titian's Venus is draped up to her thighs. But there is another fundamental shift. Titian's Venus does not only offer herself to us, she offers herself to herself. As she peeks into a mirror, obliquely held up to her by one of her infant attendants, most likely Cupid, she appears to become her own spectacle. Only 25 years later, in 1580, another great Venetian, Paolo Veronese, paints another Venus with a mirror, often referred to as Venus at her toilet. Both compositions are dominated by a dramatic torsion. But the torsion that Titian imagined as part of the external circumstances of Venus's boudoir is internalized and literally incorporated in Veronese's painting. Titian has the mirror held at the extreme right of Venus and slanted in such a way as to reflect only a sliver of her face. 
In Veronese's masterpiece, the muscular and very androgynous back of the goddess dominates the foreground and looks almost disconnected from the delicate feminine features of her face. There is truly nothing static about this painting. Leaning slightly backwards, Venus in ca is captured, pushing her head to the right with her left hand in order to catch a full glimpse of her face in the mirror. As in Titian's painting, Cupid is holding up the mirror for her. But Veronese has the goddess adjust its angle with her own hand so that the mirror faces almost flatly the viewer of the painting. You see Venus is holding her mirror up for herself. Yet Venus is not in the position in which we are, which raises the question of whether what we see in the mirror coincides with what she sees of herself in it. If so, if she's holding the mirror up for herself, if so, is she have holding the mirror up for herself or for us? And if it is for us, what are we actually seeing? Is it the idealized view that Venus has of herself, a delicate female beauty with an unreadable smile on her face? Or is it the idealized view that Veronese is feeding us of the goddess Venus? What then to say of how this impossible reflection, indeed a virtual persona, relates to the full-bodied Venus that occupies most of the painting? Is there a dialectics or a mutually exclusive relation between the two? And what is the relation between the ideal of Venus as the goddess of beauty, the object of attraction and fantasy, and this embodiment of Venus portrayed as, if she, as she is twisting her neck to fully inspect herself in the mirror? The fundamental indeterminacy haunting Veronese's portrayal of Venus in her boudoir takes center stage in the third variation on the same theme. Diego Velasquez's Rockaby Venus. Painted between 1647 and 1651, almost 100 years after Titian, and most likely during one of Velasquez's trip to Italy, it is dominated by a mirror that spatially and thematically organizes the pictorial space. Spatially, the mirror is simply the perspectival focus of the composition. That is its oculus, or vanishing point. Said very simply, the mirror is where all the lines that move away from us converge. But thematically, too, the mirror plays a pivotal role by making the whole painting into an allegory of its own indeterminate meaning. To start, Venus is depicted as, as turning her back to the viewer. We cannot tell who she is, actually. We would not recognize her on the street. Since we do not see her face, we have no way of establishing any link of resemblance between the full-bodied Venus and the reflection of the female face reflected on the mirror. Moreover, lying in a sensuous position on the bed and pensively resting her head on her right arm, the goddess is immersed in a luscious context of rich fabrics dominated by shades of red, white, and gray that project their shimmer onto Venus's own skin. Much praised by critics, the glow produced by this simple color scheme stands in mysterious contrast with the blurriness of the face in the mirror. Reversing all intuitions, instead of reflecting the light back to the viewer, the mirror absorbs it as if it existed in an invisible cone of shade. But even in the face of all this subtle perceptual incoherence, the core of indeterminacy lies in yet another twist. Venus is not in front of the mirror that is supposedly reflecting her image. Therefore, from her oblique position, Venus is only pretending to look at herself in the mirror. Who then, if not Venus, 
is looking at herself in it. Who is it that we are seeing? Is what we presume is a mirror, indeed a mirror, or is it rather a portrait of a woman that has nothing to do with Venus? For all their differences, one question underlies all three masterpieces. Why do we believe Venus? Why does it take us so long to unmask that she's only pretending to look at herself in the mirror, whereas in reality, she's looking at us? In the psychology of perception, the phenomenon by which we believe that if someone looks into a mirror from whatever angle, they will see themselves in it, is referred as the Venus effect. Whether or not mirrors are used deliberately to deceive us, a bulk of experiments have proved that we tend to believe that the mirror, end quote, shows us something that we accept as the view available to the actor in the scene. This is from the seminal study on the Venus effect. In this paper, I want to explore the possibility that the principle governing our existence among screens is a kind of Venus effect, and suggest that we may conceive of mirrors as bare screens, and of screens as populated mirrors. In all three paintings, Venus is not looking at herself, and yet we perceive her looking at herself. In fact, she's looking squarely at us, seducing us to keep watching and get lost in a narrative of the pictorial space to which we give credence and legitimacy. And I want to specify that I'm mostly <coughs> going to speak about political screens or screens with whom we have political encounters. And so this notion of mirrors as bare screens and screens as populated mirrors applies mostly to political encounters with screens. This, I will claim, is how we experience screens as operating in our daily existence. My phenomenological investigation starts by registering that our relation to screens is not modeled on the trope of the window open or closed onto the real world. We perceive screens as behaving more like mirrors, as we expect them to faithfully reproduce the view of the actors whose reflection they capture. This is what we anticipate when we use a touch screen or we buy a train ticket at the booth. Screens in all these cases bear a relation with truth, transparency, and reliability. The magic of the Venus effect is not disconnected from the expectation at the core of the liberal tradition's view of the media as the watchdog of democracy. This tradition's deep influence on us calls for transparency and perhaps explains the power of screens to pull us in and quickly surrender to the stories they tell. In the same way that in the three canvases depicting Venus at the toilet, mirrors are held up to her that is arranged and tilted so as to offer images as tightly framed as possible in the manner of a close-up. Our experience of living among screens can be described as a spectacle of the spectacle. No matter how tight the framing of the close-up is, however, what is reflected in the mirror looks out to the viewer. These populated mirrors are thus constitutively oriented outward. The spectator who remains off screen is an essential component of their meaning. In line with Judith Butler's articulation of politically saturated frames, I want to ask what it means that these screens never quite contain the scene that they're meant to delineate. 
as Butler observes, quote, something was already outside, which made the very sense of the inside possible, recognizable. This excess makes screens function according to a logic of indeterminate deferral. We recognize who they are populated by in terms of other reflections that we have seen and that have impacted our sense of reality, our affective as well as normative context. In a sense, we look at these screens while they are already looking at us from behind. We see only what we can recognize from what we have already seen. After recalling Butler's distinction between apprehension and recognition, I will elaborate on her suggestion that the structure of frames demands that they break out and break from themselves continually. My suggestion is that very much like frames, screens too break with themselves as they move through space and time, holding the potential to break out of the context that determines their legibility. There is no doubt that screens delimit the sphere of appearance. In a short essay entitled Screen Memory, Freud describes traumatic memory as having a double valence. In embodying a trace of the traumatic experience, a screen memory both renders it visible and occludes it. Screens have a similar double valence. Not only the individual or the groups, but the populations that make it onto the screen do so at the expense of others whose existence, indeed humanity, becomes increasingly invisible or at least invisible in their dignity as human beings. As screens progressively colonize our horizon, the problem is not only to broaden individual groups and populations' access to screens, but to consider how existing norms allocate recognition differentially. We need to shift the norms of recognizability to produce more democratic results. Who knows to whom we owe the misconceptualization of screens as windows? We can only presume that we owe it to some brain in the Microsoft marketing department. Who convinced Bill Gates and other eminence gris to call Windows its operating system and Windows with a small w the individual screens that constitute its building blocks. But we know with certainty who has definitively undone that misconceptualization, and this is Mauro Carbone. Among the many things that we owe to Mauro, including the organization of this conference, is to have articulated a detailed genealogy of the window, which is key to understanding what it is to live among screens. In his reconstruction, the window is the optical device of the long stretch of modern thought that goes from Leon Battista Alberti to Husserl, in line with the ancient image of the eye as a window into the soul, the trope of the window becomes a fundamental lens to frame the world as the eye itself. Alberti recommends that the painter looks at the world through an imaginary window through which spatial relations can be made to fit the parameters set out by Renaissance perspective. The experience of seeing and painting is likened to a window open to the gaze of the viewer, wherever that is oriented. Carboni notes that this conception of the window entails a spectacular and more specifically theatrical model, a division of space into a here and a there that sharply separates the roles of the seer from the seen. He writes, to assume the window as the model of our seeing the world 
means, therefore, to conceive a vision as an operation characterized by the separation between spectator and spectacle, end of quote, and by their standing face to face from one another. I agree with Mauro that while the window has been the optical device of modernity, precisely because of the separation it calls for between subject and object, seer and seen, it cannot be the optical device of our epoch of interactive exchanges and digital personae. The optical device of our age is definitely the screen, which cannot thus be assimilated to a window. Unlike the window that occludes when, it's, when it is closed and reveals when it is open, the screen is a surface whose opacity does not hide, but rather allows us to see. Screens are endowed with a productive relation to ambiguity, reflected in the etymology of the term, which is suspended between the shield that protects and the reflecting surface that exposes. Ambiguity also pertains to the screen's immersive glow that seems to fluidify, if not outright dissolve, the separation between seer and seen. The indissoluble complementarity between light and shade that Mauro interprets as the essence of the cinematic model of vision is well described by Merleau-Ponty's reversal of Platonism when he writes that images are not a stencil, a copy, a second thing, but possibly what drives us to see the world in a way rather than another. I would like to develop Merleau-Ponty's insight that images are primary, for they drive us to see the world in a way rather than in another, and interrogate it in light of Butler's theory of politically saturated frames, and most crucially, frames that determine which lives can be apprehended as vulnerable, that is potentially worthy of grief, and which aren't. Butler's argument was developed in conjunction with what she defines as the states, and more specifically the Bush's regime's attempt to regulate the visual field by controlling which images of the war in Iraq should be published and disseminated in the public sphere and which shouldn't. The phenomenon of embedded reporting, the arrangement by which the news media agreed to report only from locations and about situations embedded by the, established by the military command, was and still is a chief instrument of regulation of the visual field. Embedded individuals or crews of journalists and photographers traveled only on certain convoys and related back to the public only certain images and scenes. Basically, embedded reporting, in reporting implied and still implies an agreement, end quote, not to make the mandating of perspective itself into a topic to be reported and discussed. The representation of the Iraq War, the second Iraq War, was thus restricted to established parameters or politically saturated frames that included control over content, such as the demand not to publish images of the war dead. I'm sorry, here there is an issue. I'll look at them later. Of the war dead, um, American as well as Iraqis. Uh, not to dwell on coffins of American soldiers shrouded in flags, and control over perspective, such as not to film the action and destruction of war. With this attempt to regulate the perspective in addition to the content, the state authorities were clearly interested in regulating the visual modes of participation in the war. Such regulation of perspective was internalized very deeply and started to operate autonomously from the centralized governmental apparatus. For example, Butler mentions the photographs of the human rights abuses in the military detention center of Abu Ghraib. And quote, the camera angle, the frame, the pose subjects, all suggest that those who took the photographs were actually involved 
in the perspective of the war, elaborating that perspective, crafting, commending, and validating a point of view, end of quote. The point here is that our ability to respond to the suffering of others, end quote, depends on a field of perceptible reality having already been established. This field of perceptible reality is one in which the notion of the recognizable human is formed and maintained over and against what cannot be named or regarded as the human, a figure of the non-human that negatively determines and potentially unsettles the recognizably human." End of quote. As Merleau-Ponty well argued, images are primary, for they drive us to see the world in a way rather than in another. Whether the images are fixed images or in movement, photographs or films that populate our screens, they become legible, recognizable in terms of a field of perceptible reality that is already in existence because it is the condition of our ability to read what is in front of us and, makes, and make sense of it. Screens, which are in my reading politically saturated frames, delimit the sphere of appearance and contain norms that allocate recognition differentially. The question of what it means to live among screen today or better, to live through screens today, is thus a fundamental political question and perhaps the most urgent question of democratic theory before us today. In order to produce more democratic results, we have to shift the norms of recognizability. And only by shifting those norms will we allow ourselves and our public to be more inclusive with regard to which lives can be potentially grieved, that is, that can be apprehended as exposed to the risk of being injured or lost. The relevance of the Venus effect to my argument is that our epistemological capacity to apprehend, to apprehend a life is at least partially conditioned by that very specific life being produced according to norms that qualified as a life. This is the sense in which the images that we see reflected or projected onto screens always look back at us. The eye contact between Venus and her viewer is so very important because it embodies the viewer's epistemological capacity to interpret what the goddess pretends to show of herself that I've called the spectacle of the spectacle. The norms of recognition, however, do not only have an epistemological function, which is to organize visual experience, but also the power to generate specific ontologies of the subject. And quote, subjects are constituted through norms, which in their reiteration produce and shift the terms through which subjects are recognized. These normative conditions for the production of the subject produce an historically contingent ontology." End of quote. These historically contingent ontologies determine our capacity to both discern and name the being of the subject. Are we then locked in a zero-sum game in which norms of recognition are vertically established by whoever holds the lever of political, communicative, military, and market power. What can be done to shift the norms of recognizability, which are responsible for both the production of subjects and the historically contingent ontologies in which subject exist? What can we do to interject the angle from which, in my allegory, the cupids are holding the mirror up to Venus and tilting it so that it would be, so that it would be mostly visible by the viewer as in a close-up shot?
In her Frames of War, Butler draws a distinction between apprehension and recognition, a term with a complex Hegelian legacy. Simplifying a bit her argument, she claims that there are acts of knowing that, they are, that are not subsumable under recognition. If it is true that claims about life and death from the debates on when life begins for an embryo to what constitutes clinical death do not exist independently from some frame of reference dictated by the norms of recognition, it is also true that life and death exceed those frames and the norms that underlie them. Because life and death are inconceivable but in reference to some frame, but do not coincide with them. Life and death are larger than the norms through which we represent them. Said in Jacques Derrida's language, there is always a remainder, a trace, a difference of life, suspended and spectral, that haunts every normative instance of life. This is because every normative instance is haunted by its very limit or failure. This limit assume, assumes in Butler a figural form, and that form is the living. While we recognize specific lives, we apprehend something, not exactly someone, as simply living. This figure of the living and quote, falls outside the frame furnished by the norm, but only as a relentless double whose ontology cannot be secured, but whose living status is open to apprehension. End of quote. The space of apprehension, which is an area of affect outside of recognition, but still sensitive to social crafting and potential moral deliberation, is where both the horror of dehumanization lies and the promise of a more democratic politics. For in repeating themselves and hitting different contexts around the world and through time, frames break out of familiar territory and constantly face the challenge of breaking with themselves. This is an argument that Derrida and Butler share with, Walt, with Walter Benjamin. No repetition or iteration, iterability, Derrida calls it, exists without the delimitation of a new context. No frame contains completely what it conveys. Frames, therefore, structurally tend to break apart. End quote. In other words, the frame does not hold anything together in one place, but itself becomes a kind of perpetual breakage, subject to a temporal logic by which it moves from place to place. As the frame constantly breaks from its context, this self-breaking becomes part of the very definition. End of quote. The efficacy of the frames that populate our screens is also, therefore, their vulnerability. Not only moving images, videos, footage, and films, but photographs haunt us, and they're the ones that press for shifting dominant norms of recognizability. And these are, yes, of course, the images that made it out of Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib. This is the twin image of the one you saw before. But perhaps even more poignantly, photographs of atrocity emptied of human present and presence haunt us too. Whether in Beirut in 1984 or in Chernobyl in 2014 or in Germany in 1944, 
These are screens that in exposing radical precariousness break out of their contexts while breaking with themselves, which is all is needed for a new trajectory of affect. Thank you. Merci, Giovanna Boradori, pour cette présentation très intéressante qui a montré ce qui était encore resté un peu caché dans ce jour, dont on avait parlé, mais pas trop eh, de manière manifeste, c'est-à-dire la valeur politique de l'écran, qui est dans l'écran et dehors l'écran lui-même. Et, et donc maintenant, je passe la parole à... Richard Cook, qui est professeur en architecture and the visual arts et auprès de la School of Architecture, University of Liverpool. Il est aussi directeur du Center for Architecture and the Visual Arts, CAVA, et directeur de, re de recherche et auprès de la School of the Arts. Et en même temps, est directeur et est fondateur de la compagnie de production Cinetecture Ltd. Son expérience professionnelle est, est, est dans l'architecture et dans la réalisation des films. Et dans les deux domaines, il a, deux domaines, il a travaillé et, au niveau international depuis longtemps. Ses recherches euh, et présente une intersection de euh, pratiques et, et théories. Et, euh, il, euh, il, a, et, il a écrit et édité et nombreux et livres, parmi lesquels Cinemat euh, Cinematic Urban Geographies, Picasso and the Politics of Visual Representation, The City and the Moving Image, et aussi, euh, il est auteur de, numéreux, de nombreux articles et euh, chapitres de livres sur les films, la culture visuelle et euh, les villes. Il est auteur de la monographie Cinescapes, Cinematic Spaces in Architecture and Cities. Et donc, euh, je vous remercie d'être avec nous et je vous donne la parole, Richard. Thank you very much for this very detailed uh, uh, curriculum vitae. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mauro, for this very kind uh, invitation to come to Lyon. This is an exceptional opportunity for me to come to a city that I always wanted to go to, because for me, obviously, Lyon, c'est la ville de la frère de lumière et de cinéma. So this is very special uh, for me. Um, I am, as you heard in the introduction, I come from an architectural background and I teach in the School of Architecture and I practiced as an architect. So what I will present to you with regards to the relationship between uh, screens uh, and, and space obviously have a, uh, uh, you know, an architectural perspective and I, and I hope this will be of, of, interest, um, of interest to you. Um, I would like to, uh, actually the, the title of my, or the subtitle of my presentation uh, is chosen very carefully. I called it facing the screen. And I, I thought I, I use this because this presentation today really is about this notion of facing because we, we face at least two things. First of all, we face as citi citizens in everyday urban spaces, I think quite interesting transformations which are almost unrecognizable to some of us because they're too close to us and I would like to draw an attention to it. And then in more in quite literal terms, I think screens um, can be uh, yeah, in our face in quite literal terms, as you will see in, inside the presentation. But let's start perhaps with something which, which we are all much more familiar, and that is uh, cinema and going to the movies. And I would like to by <clears throat> start by saying uh, that going to the movies, obviously, uh, has a totally different meaning today than in its formative years of uh, cinema, or even 20 or 30 years ago. And while in the early years, uh, going to the movies meant that you, know, you went as part of a fairground attraction uh, and later a theatrical visit, you know, in the majority of cases today, we encounter moving images outside such distinct spatial 
acts and spatial events. And um, not only did television and video transform our living spaces to home theaters and changing the moving image event from a collective to a more individual practice, but also the consumption of moving images involved from a space specific to a space independent act. And also the digital revolution has meant that moving images today are indispensable means of communication, information, and advertisement, as well as narrative film. And I consider this to be myself a cineast and come from a sort of a, a filmic background uh, in professional terms. But I think when we talk about film and cinema today, we cannot talk only about narrative films anymore. So also we are living at times when the small cinemas are gradually disappearing from our city centers. Um, paradoxically, more and more signs of what I called filmic or cinematic influences, I think, are, are present. And living in the 21st century means that we're now surrounded by digital moving images anytime and everywhere with a frequency and intimacy that is unprecedented in human uh, history. And when I, meant, when I said that cinemas are disappearing, I would like to draw attention to a research project that I'm doing with uh, at the college at uh, Cambridge University and, and, and Edinburgh University where we look at Battersea and these two Im images on a wall um, are, it's the same space and there's a time gap of about 80, 90 years and you see that a, you know, a theatrical uh, place, a, a cinema has turned into a natural remedy store where you can get your, you know, your life enhancing drugs I, I suppose, uh, it's quite interesting. So, while in the past we would uh, consume films and moving images primarily in the cinema and later in our homes, the digital age really means that they have now conquered every corner of our urban lives. And Marshall McLuhan once noted his famous quote that the mechanization was never so vividly fragmented or sequential as in the birth of the movies, and that the movie by sheer speeding up of the mechanical carried us from the world of sequences and or sequence and connections into the world of creative configuration and structure. If I hear structure, I think architecture, obviously. So I was asking myself the question, or I said, you know, one wonders, if this notion of configuration and structure is indeed just limited to a reading of pictures, or if the medium of film has contributed to new ways in which the city presents itself or is perceived and ultimately has an impact on us as human beings. Screens being mounted in um, spaces, installed on buildings and held in our hands invite us to actively, but quite often also passively, consume moving images you know, everywhere, in university food halls, uh, hotel lobbies, medical surgeries, even public toilets. And even during those times when we uh, I take pictures of these public toilet screens, by the way. Even during those times when we ourselves are on the move, in airplanes, in buses, on escalators, you know, we observe those moving images. So I think there's a very wonderful phenomenological uh, element in that. So I have dwelt on this idea that perhaps indeed we are standing on the verge of a quite sizable transformation in the relationship between screen-based media and urban landscapes, which seemingly occurs unnoticed amongst the hype of image consumption, despite being right in front of our eyes. Visual and urban phenomena typically associated with screens, such as advertisement and film, have begun to close that gap between two-dimensional representation and three, or perhaps, dare I say, a four-dimensional experience. And while from it, it was in the past, places like Times Square uh, in New York or Piccadilly Circus in London or you know, places in Tokyo and, and, and elsewhere, which have led the way in demonstrating the application of, for instance, light emitting technologies in uh, urban inner city settings. Many other cities today, even my own city, Liverpool, which is a relatively small place, uh, employ large screens for the dissemination of news and a display of advertisement of all kinds. And these play an important role 
in the in visual intensity of a place and also the sort of what we how we make sense of a place and in fact if we remember those futuristic images that we used to look at uh, of high-tech cityscapes known for instance from such films such as Blade Runner in which a flat large media facades are mounted on building surfaces are far of course far away from cutting edge uh, uh, of today's technology and indeed might soon be seen as nostalgic visions of the past which to me is quite scary because I remember when Blade Runner came out and that was like wow this is the future. Um, so, we perhaps see the beginning of an era in which light-emitting screens are becoming more than just digital billboards and are therefore no longer simply a replacement of the static images uh, by animated ones. New technological uh, innovation in the field of image visualization has begun, in my mind, to do two things in relation to space. First, they have changed the measurable distance between the body and the screen, which really happens on a micro scale. And second, two-dimensional images have started to conquer three-dimensional space. And I'll talk about this on a macro scale. I'll start with the micro scale. At the level of people's direct engagement with moving images, quite literal, the distance between the human body and screens have systematically decreased over time and perhaps will eventually shrink to nothing. In a conventional cinematic setting, as you probably remember, we are here in a wonderful auditorium, you might be sitting eight to 10 meters away from the screen. Then obviously with the inauguration of, um, with the invention of television in the late 20s and then the rolling out of television in the 1950s, that distance between me the subject and the screen shrank down to you know, a few meters, perhaps three meters. And we all know with PCs and personal computers, that distance of three meters shrank down to perhaps a meter or 80 centimeter. Then with handheld devices there, those screens have been away from us, you know, the length of an arm. And we all know with inventions like Google Glasses, they become now very quite close to our face. And I ask myself, um, how much longer before technological solution is a, a technological solution is found to close this sort of last final centimeters that uh, separates me as a human being uh, from the screen? And here a little little anecdote. In 2001, I uh, produced a, a a short film. Uh, 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 with a French title, it was very controversial. The title was Avenir, <laughs> uh, Avenir 2015. And I predicted at the time or sketched a vision of a near future in which people would be wearing contact lenses through which they would uh, encounter, you know, um, they could get emails and, 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 and uh, have video conferencing and, and do other things. So essentially, a contact lens that would directly. Um, send out a light uh, signal to the retina uh, of your eye. And when I produced the film in a, in a basement studio in Cambridge, a representative of a British telecommunications company came by, looked over my shoulder and said, huh, what are you doing there? I said, yeah, I know, I was very embarrassed. I said, Oof, this is a mad idea, I'm a student and I have this idea that perhaps in the future we would be wearing contact lenses. And that was 2001. And he said, yeah, 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 yeah. He was from an R&D department and he <laughs> said, <laughs> he said, uh, mm, we have been thinking about this, but, you know, we might just go with, you know, using glasses instead. <laughs> and um, I, I, when I wrote my... <clears throat> my recent book, uh, Cinescapes, in which I, I dwell on that, uh, literally a month be before I submitted uh, the script, I was absolutely delighted um, to, to find out that actually uh, the Journal of Micromechanics and Microengineering published the results of a research group uh, from the University of Washington, uh, Seattle and Alto University, which have successfully tested a wirelessly powered contact, contact lens 
uh, with an integrated molecule light emitting diode on uh, and the test of this device on live rabbits. So for those of you who haven't seen this, and I guess some of you might know this, but actually, you know, a contact lens has now been uh, developed and is tested on, on live animals that can do more or less, or is intended that it could do more or less exactly what I uh, dwelled on or predicted or sort of thought about in, in 2001, uh, which I, I think is, is quite uh, interesting. And uh, this is not the only sort of bit of technology that is coming around with contact lenses. Uh, Novaris and Google have sort of partnered up with these smart lenses and you can now uh, they're, they're intending to, to issue smart lenses that can actually measure your blood sugar levels. And that is very relevant because over 380 million people are suffering from diabetes. So soon we will be literally connected with these technological devices. So I, where am I going with this? Well, actually, uh, while obviously in 2001 this um, the concept of cybernetics and, and was still sort of science fiction, perhaps inspired by movies like Terminator, or certainly my film was probably inspired by that. Uh, it has totally become reality today, and the direction that this research will take us is, um, I think, quite clear. Uh, augmented reality lenses will change or have the potential of, of changing the way we access information as well as perceive and interact with the spatial environment we inhabit. And there are a number of researchers who, who, who discuss these things, and Lingle and a group of other uh, uh, researchers have done so. And they talk about variable computing and, and contact lens systems, which indeed may receive data from external platforms, mobile phones, and provide real-time notification of important events. So this is underpinned by people that are much smarter than me and actually know how to program stuff. So on, on a macro scale, so I'll... Let's move away from the human being for the moment and, and look at the larger scale of architecture. And I think at the level of architecture and urban spaces, those uh, so-called 3D uh, projection mapping, um, I think a few years ago, introduced a quite uh, new way of projecting moving images onto buildings. And um, I guess Lyon is the city of light and you have festivals that are dedicated to these uh, 3D projection mapping. So you are very well aware of um, the effect that 3D mapping uh, can, can have. Um, I think it's worth to be reminded uh, how this technique has started out and how it is going to be or is used now and how, might, how, how it might be used in the future. Because I think this technique has its origins really in, in in, in, in the artists' community and innovative groups and companies such as Urban Screen in, in Bremen, Germany, or a new former in Holland, have begun to you know, develop these ideas and use them in very artistic ways on, on very well-known pieces of architecture, like, for instance, the Kunsthaus by Oswald Matthias Ungers or the Bauhaus in Dessau and, and other places. Um, but the commercial world obviously sees great potential in this. And in no time, um, I think this has been picked up by uh, big companies and uh, big corporations and produced uh, other 3D projection mapping events of gigantic and extraordinary scale. This is not a presentation about 3D mapping, but just one slide. Uh, this is uh, the Millbank Tower, a great two-listed building in, 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 the, in London. and. An entire building was transformed into a mobile phone because a mobile phone company launched a new mobile phone and the simple shape of the building somehow lent itself to be turning it into a mobile phone, I guess. And uh, it was accompanied with, a, with, with an audio event as well. So there was like live music to it and uh, a visual and an audiovisual feast of, of, um, of quite some, some scale. Uh, I would like to show you a small clip of uh, uh, a 3D mapping um, project that was commissioned by um, the fashion label Lyle uh, Lauren in 2010. And um, um, it was called uh, The Ultimate Fusion of Art, Fashion and Technology, a Visual Feast for the Five Centers. And um, this project is, uh, I think, exceptional in the sense that it turns architecture into a stage. It turns architecture, quite literal, into uh, 
into uh, yeah in in a theat into a theatrical uh, setting uh, in a stage set actually, and um, this is uh, quite innovative because also it mixed live footage um, and composite uh, composite of digital images animation and, and live footage into a, a, a quite stunning uh, exercise. So I think I should show you what, what I mean and then we'll talk about it. The company who produced it, um, Can we have the sound? done by a London-based company called Drive Productions, also responsible for the Millbank Tower projection. So I'll take this, the sound away while I'll talk over the images. In an interview, David Lawrence, Senior Vice President of Advertising, Marketing and Corporate Communications, pointed out that the show was linked to the company's new online presence and marketing strategy that they call, this is a great term, merchantainment, a phrase that blends merchandising and entertainment and could have been uh, coined obviously by Guy Debord. Uh, a, a quote by Charles Landry, um, I think, puts uh, describes it very well. He doesn't talk about this, uh, this event, so I mean, the quote is earlier than actually 3D projection mapping. But he, he says that the so-called experience comedy cannot be ignored, a rapprochement between everyday living consumption and spectacle, shaping what cities look like and feel. And I think that's just the territory in which I am uh, working uh, in the intersection between architecture and, and the visual arts today. So again, an area that I think we have to closely watch and, and observe. Uh, however, um, 3D mapping is not the n only sort of um, technological innovation in, in recent years that I think make a quite interesting contribution to the way we engage with uh, urban environments or we might engage with urban environments. And um, 3D technology has been present in film and television for quite some time, but the need for for us to wear these cumbersome glasses um, probably prevented it from being as influential as some might have expected it to be. Uh, today, television se sets are currently available on the mass market, obviously with 3D images, uh, and also broadcast channels are, are, are broadcasting on 3D, uh, but still, again, we have to wear these, uh, these glasses, as I said. So, but I think it's worth to was to, to say that there are a number of developments on the way uh, with LCD technology and, uh, and, and, and other ways which will make it possible potentially to create autostereoscopic displays of a particular size. We can produce autostereoscopic displays, displays for which you don't need to wear any glasses but you have an impression of a 3D image, you have the impression of depth with smaller devices like, for instance, a Nintendo DS or, or mobile phones. 
But if you want to do it on a bigger scale, there, there are some optical uh, problems with that. But those, uh, I, I know and from visiting a number of research institutes that um, companies are, are, and research institutes are, are working very hard to overcome this problem. And in the meantime, um, we can look in the near future by studying one of Sung Sung uh, latest uh, TV commercials produced by G and Partners in London, shot in Buenos Aires and launched in April of 2010 as part of a eight million um, pound uh, campaign, campaign to promote 3D TV sets. And in this uh, advertisement film, we see gigantic screens built from multiple television sets mounted on buildings and laid out on the streets. It's that image. And the viewer of the uh, advertisement commercial gets to see how 3D screens can create optical illusions that give a sense of depth. As a result, the viewer gains an understanding of what it would be like if 3D television was installed in a large city such as Buenos Aires and how 3D images could become part of an everyday experience. And I would like to show you a short clip from that. See the image of the cat on the billboard? Yeah? Yeah? When, when I saw this moment in the clip, I couldn't stop to wonder what would be the consequence for us as architects or people that try to turn students into practicing architects. If suddenly we have to tell them that the facade, which obviously has a a, a long tradition of what a facade is and what it means and what it's supposed to be doing in the field of architecture. But if that notion of the facade is, is basically changed or, or, or could be used in, in by commercial companies or advertising agencies, and what does it actually mean? That th to me, this is architecturally uncharted territory because potentially we could create the illusion of nothingness in cities. We could make buildings disappear. I've written about this, uh, you know, on this idea that some cities would like to have certain uh, buildings disappear and they use screen tacti tactics to do so. Uh, and I think that technology would just be a, a feast for marketing agencies and, and city councils to change the appearance of the cities. What does it mean to a skyline of the city? So, I'm, I, I apologize, but there is, I think, a lot of um, theoretical uh, ground to think about this more, more seriously. Also, I would like to emphasize and stress, I don't think this is going to happen uh, right away. So, I could end my presentation here, probably show you another clip, but I'd, I'd rather uh, have a more open-ended session here. And you probably are wondering, okay, so where do we move from here? And that's more or less, my, my book ends there, and, and, and since then I have been thinking a little bit about, well, where would we move from here? Um, I have to say, when I entered the field of film and architecture, I had the impression that we were talking here, or I'm operating in a, in a system of at least three sort of distinct fields. That of urban culture, that was my own one, like coming from the field of architecture. Then we have a screen culture. I dealt with colleagues from, from, from film and, and media studies. And then obviously we have, we're engaging with people. But this concept is obviously totally out of the window. Those boundaries, 10 years later, for me, don't exist at, anymore at all. Uh, technological innovation, 
movement and social acts, our behavior also has changed and completely eradicated some of those boundaries. And we have now dimensional shifts. We have advertising playing a role in architecture. We have marketing, mapping, uh, tracking, physiological data is suddenly available to us. Um, we have capturing technology, variable computation, economy, kinesthetics, so many things play a role now um, that I think we are truly living in exciting times and truly interdisciplinary times. And my research center is very much uh, you know, in that interdisciplinary field uh, working. Now, remember that I showed you this image. Some of you probably have thought, oh yes, this is a very simplistic thing. Yeah, yeah, we knew about this. And you're right, yes, you knew about this. I guess for some of us it's clear that the physical distance has, has been shrinking down, but that was only half the truth. I was not giving you the full truth. <laughs> I was lying to you. See? I perceived you. I think what's really happening is that screens have begun to look back. So that point of you know, zero, and that's my simplistic imagination that the end point is a contact lens to stick it into your eye, which I actually, the idea came up because I'm, I have chosen the eye only because I thought it was the most sensitive part of the body, you know, where we could, where I could emphasize how technology is touching the body. So I have chosen the, I chosen the eye. But that, that, that zero point has, is out of the windows because screens are looking back at us. And I think that is a totally uh, a seismic shift uh, because it's a reversed case. We, I guess, uh, and we have probably media historians here amongst us who can, can contribute to that, but I think our relationship with images or screens is one where we are in a certain authoritative position and we look at a screen. We look at a cave drawing. The cave drawing not necessarily looks back at us. But I think now we obviously, uh, you can buy for $99 eye tracking devices that you can mount to your television. Is it, is it allowed in France? I don't know. We don't know. Well, it sh soon will be allowed in France, I'm sure. <laughs> Globalization is everywhere. Um, we also, when we look at screens themselves, screens are, actually you could obviously argue as well historically, cinematic screens were never flat as well, and yes, but you know, the television screens now and mobile phone screens, they are curved, they are, they are flexible. LG is developing this, uh, this, this film, uh, which, um, which is a totally flexible screen and we will soon see a lot of devices um, probably that would employ such technologies. We also always believe that screens are somehow a service, a, a surface on which we look on to. Well, that's not really true anymore either. LG and other companies are developing transparent screens, transparent screens so we can look through these screens uh, for a commercial market. I also think, and these are just reflections, you know, this is not worked out, but these are reflections on, on, on my own work, is that I can see a, a quite stunning desire of us as, 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 a, as a population of people, um, everyday people, that we would like to have a connection with, a physical connection with images. And I had a, a wonderful moment on my last uh, trip to, to China when I, I was observing a group of uh, Chinese women standing in a street in which uh, we they, they mounted a historical streetscapes, and you had people standing, you know, on that billboard on that wall, touching it and situating themselves literally into it and posing it for a photograph. So there's a, a, a very interesting. Um, uh, there are interesting things going on. It also relates to memory, for instance, to, and, and, and memory in space, and going back and these, so touching those spatial memories. Um, well, technology, thankfully, with this sort of physical connection, is going to help us a lot because Kinect has come out, and uh, uh, television screens and other screens can now capture and track and even map our, our movement. And that uh, uh, obviously uh, is in everybody's mind today, but just let's be reminded again that there's a long tradition to that actually. It goes back to, you know, Etienne Jules Marais and others. So cinema played a role in the sort of tracking of, of, of bodily movement. And in the film Avatar and other films, we use devices now that capture the, 
uh, the movement of people and, and use it then to uh, composite it back into, uh, in, into the film. Um, so in, in summary, and um, just a few more bullet points, because this is really a conference about screens, and my reflection on, on screens is that I think this Mauro will probably slightly disagree, but let's say the 20th century notion of, of, a, of a screen um, is pretty much obsolete in the world that I inhabit. Um, uh, screens are much more than just optical uh, devices of, of modernity, I think. Uh, the defined frame, the defined boundaries of screens are, uh, are not clear anymore. Uh, Eric yesterday mentioned that screens can become invisible, and I think that is true as well. If you get closer to a screen, it becomes invisible. Um, screens are not anymore static. They're not anymore passive. Uh, they are, I hesitate to use the term interactive, because most interactivity is actually just participatory activity, not real interactivity. But screens have a tendency to, to appear to be interactive. Um, screens have left the two-dimensional character that we know. Screens are more than surfaces. I think cityscapes could be seen almost like screens. Um, the long-established one-directional gaze uh, is uh, eradicated. Um, we have a new relationship between observer and the observed with regards to screens, which I think is a very important and fundamental point to make, which holds a lot of political dimension in it, and authority and connects to, to your presentation. So the impact on this, on architecture and the built environment, this is really what I'm concerned uh, of, and because I think, I think there's a potential that those technologies can um, change the spaces we, we inhabit, and the old notion of a city, for instance, offering us a shared space, um, also a shared memory in a sense, um, is through technologies like augmented reality, if you imagine that you can overlay your perception of cityscapes with a tailored information towards you, uh, sort of quite literally undermined. So we're, we're not potentially not inhabiting even the same spaces anymore. So we don't necessarily have the same shared memory. Um, so again, I think uh, uncharted territory. This notion of tailored city spaces also relates to what Bernard said this morning about Taylorism, uh, by the way. I would like to end with a that's the end of my presentation. I'm probably I'm mostly on time, but just a few more seconds on a on a clip which I found most inspiring, um, um, and that will show you what screens uh, can can really be and how we might want to reevaluate what we think screens are. This is uh, an artistic installation by uh, Bradley Mankiewicz bought in Dolly and it was recorded in San Francisco about a year ago. What you see here is live action recorded with a camera. So this is not digital compositing, it's not cheating in the, in the sense that it was edited afterwards. Afterwards, it was recorded live. So what you see here is this flat surface that a man appears to be holding his hand.
I'll stop here because that should give you enough food for thought and perhaps uh, food for a discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Merci beaucoup pour uh, cette uh, présentation très intéressante. C'était deux présentations, à mon avis, très, très stimulantes qui nous aidaient à penser ce qui insiste, uh, on peut dire, uh, dehors. Les, les écrans ou sur les limites euh, des écrans et ils l'ont présenté d'une manière assez complémentaire si d'un côté on a vu comment les écrans euh, se rapprochent et se mêlent avec les corps et avec euh, la ville de l'autre côté on a vu la, la valeur, la, la nature politique de se, se rapprocher au corps et à la ville et donc à la, à la vie communautaire et donc à la, à la vie politique. Mais cette manière de questionner les limites des, des écrans et notre rapport avec ces limites et ce qui insiste, d'ailleurs l'écran nous amène aussi, comme vous l'avez montré très bien tous les deux, à euh, considérer que les, comment et les écrans nous regardent à considérer l'effet qu'il y a un regard euh, des écrans euh, porté euh, sur nous. Et donc, euh, on a, je remercie aussi, parce que vous, êtes, euh, vous avez fait des présentations très, je, je comment le dire, parfaites pour les temps, et donc on a euh, assez de temps pour euh, la discussion, et donc je vous invite à poser des questions. Et je vois déjà Vivian avec, <rire> et aussi derrière. Je vous dis que les questions pourront être posées et en anglais et en français, les deux intervenants préfèrent l'anglais, mais au cas où ils peuvent chercher de... Enfin, on, on va se débrouiller d'une quelque manière. Et donc, euh, merci Viviane. Thank you. Ou en allemand. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I was very tired at the beginning of this panel. I feel very energized <laughs> um, in terms of both papers. I want to address my question to Richard. Um, but it has implications for um, presentation and set of questions, I think. Um, I, I thought it was a, a really interesting and very apt set of descriptions of what's happened and happening. Um, but the question as you were talking towards the end, particularly around the 3D, which generated a thought, Um, and I started to think about Heidegger <laughs> and world picture. What happens when you replace 3D with 3D uh, in the sense, and, or buildings disappearing? Um, uh, they're obviously not disappearing. They're, they're being um, occluded by something else. So the world as surface, uh, and there, there are immense implications to that um, and it's not just about uh, a blurring of the virtual and, and the real it seems to me so I mean it's a silly question I suppose uh, what happens when you play replace 3d with 3d particularly in the mode in, in, in which you're speaking mm -hmm. I'm not sure I really expect you to answer that yeah, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> well it, uh, I think uh, To me, this is the principal question behind, you know, the, that sort of clip that I showed you. Because for us, as architects, I think we we probably thought that architects are the, or many of us think that architects are the people who sort of design cities or, or are responsible for the, some aspects of, of of space in inter cities and and uh, design city spaces. But I think the question then really is is well who then is behind the creation of 3D spaces that we seemingly inhabit and see? The other question, probably more relating to high tech, is then, is do we associate 3D with, with reality? And I think um, when you look at the, the power of, of video games and how we are drawn into these 3D immersive in, in environments, I'm not sure whether we as a, as a human populace are particularly good in making a distinction between a perceived third dimension and being in a real third dimension. I think we are, we are readily, we're quite happy to, to, uh, to suspend our disbelief and, and immerse ourselves in, in those environments. Um, 
I mean, I find it so surprising because I, I, I'm quite fond of cities and I'm quite fond of you know, the, the brick and mortar and actually see how things age and, and there's a physicality to it and also uh, uh, an element of, of time in it that is embedded in cities. And so within the three dimensionality, there's an element of time. And that element of time um, is very much uh, reduced to nanoseconds, as we heard earlier, uh, because you can change the third, the, the three dimensional appearance of billboards or, or cities then in, in, in no time. So it poses uh, so many questions for which I don't really have an answer. But I would simply say, and this is what I, I'm advocating to my architectural students is that this field of, for instance, urban screens and urban advertising is not just a, a question over aesthetics. You know, it's a much more fundamental question about uh, creating a world that we would like to inhabit uh, and pass on to future generations. And we ought to take some share of responsibility in it to take part in the shaping of our spaces then we inhabit. And the question is to whom, to which body are we handing over that responsibility? Who decides over the spaces that we inhabit? And I am afraid to say that the profession of, of architecture has lost a lot of its influence over, over, over the last uh, um, 100 years and, 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 and longer. And um, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm slightly skeptical, but at the same time also upbeat because I'm working on a daily basis with very in inspiring students. If I can add something, uh, I mean, I really appreciated your question, Vivian, and your um, reference to Heidegger. Oh, it's really interesting that Heidegger talks about the fourfold, right? Das Gefiert. He talks about the four, he doesn't talk about the three. And um, I, so when you replace 3D with 3D, right? Well, he, his world is four, is not three. And it's really important because three, three is the number of recognition. Three is the number of the Hegelian scheme, right? In which recognition is located from which it emerges. And um, the, the, the gist of what I was talking about in mentioning the Venus effect is precisely a foursome, it's not the threesome. Because Venus looks at herself in the mirror, the reflection looks out at us, but we recognize, we in fact not so much recognize, we recognize Venus, um, which maybe is not Venus, right? But we also um, apprehend something else, which is the number four, right? And is that it is living, right? It is not yet a life, is not perhaps a life that we fully recognize, but there is the potential, there is that supplement, there is that trace that, will, that allows us to, uh, you know, some flexibility with respect to that frame, some potential for revision, some, uh, and, and the possibility that the frame will by itself uh, break out of the context and break uh, with itself. So I think that the distinction between the three and the four is very important. Yeah. Paolo, and then uh, Eric. Merci, uh, thank you for your presentations, which I found very interesting. I'd like to address my, my question to Giovanna Moradori. And um, I was very fascinated by the concept of uh, Venus effect. And uh, it made me think of, uh, in relation with the last images you show, showed us in the presentation, it made me think of uh, an essay by William J.T. Mitchell, Cloning Terror, in, uh, in this text. He talks about uh, the world of images, he says that the image has two bodies, and then he says uh, that uh, the images uh, capture the spectator between two incompatible positions, uh, moving um, between a state of empathy with the victims and the state of complicity with the persecutors. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering um, if you agree with this point of view about images, and uh, if... Um, uh, about the, the Venus effect, I was wondering if uh, the screens 
uh, through which uh, we look at these images, uh, these uh, violent images, uh, involve us in a sort of Venus effect, making us incapable to decide if our point of view is the, uh, the victim of one or the, or the persecutor's one. Very interesting question. Um, yeah, there is fundamental indeterminacy. And I think that Mitchell's point is um, about indeterminacy, which is also obviously present in the Venus effect. Right? We, we don't know which image we're seeing. Um, we don't know who it is. That's why I sort of set them in a progression from Titian through Veronese to uh, Velasquez. You know, Velasquez, in a way, stages that very ambiguity, which is what we come out of um, looking at the painting with, um, even though we know that um, when we look at it, we think it's her. And so the question is, why do we, why do we believe mirrors? Why, what do we expect from mirrors? And I, I showed in the, in the, in the images, um, you know, the Magritte painting of the man facing a mirror from behind, and uh, so the unrecognizability. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I definitely agree with you that um, um, Mitchell has an interesting point that it's unclear, you know, is a point that even Kant had already spoken about, right? The Schadenfreude. So, you know, the empathy is with whom? Is it with the victim or is it with the perpetrator? Um, and to some extent, it is important to be able to say that um, we don't just um, feel empathy for the victim because we could be perpetrators, you know. And so uh, it's important to remain open to that possibility, especially on issues of terror and terrorism. However, the last images that I showed you were without anyone in them. And so to some extent, I think uh, Butler's appeal to the living, um, you know, Derrida's appeal, appeal to the trace and the supplement, um, and the very notion of indeterminacy uh, point to a subject which is not yet formed, which represents the, the promise that subjects that we already can empathize with um, might be um, the past and not the future. Because as we recognize those, we are not recognize others. And so uh, this appeal to the living, this appeal to indeterminacy, is, is an appeal with a, with, a, with a promise, with a promise of, a, of the undoing of the screens that are politically saturated and produce victims and perpetrators. Okay, so um, yes, actually I had a, originally have a, had a question for Giovanna and, uh, and I will ask that, um, uh, but um, so before I do that, uh, very briefly, I would just like to link and connect with with what Richard was just speaking, and just uh, from my my point of view, which I've also done some work on the public screens, and uh, so I, I think that so so it is really really very important uh, to look at the political dimensions of the public space itself and the uh, the kind of coded nature of that space and the things which are visible and invisible, which are allowed and denied and, and, and look for so these sort of like um, deeper links and connections for these efforts to, to sort, of like, sort of like layer these audio visually from that perspective. So I, I live in Los Angeles, uh, which is a city with quite a few examples of that kind of things and I, for, I often come to think that so the two most interesting forms within which I see this sort of like creativity happening in terms of this sort of like digital layering of the city are, are partly illegal and partly accidental. The illegal action has to do with hacking digital LED billboards. So which is one of the only ways which cre uh, is able to sort of like uh, sort of like incorporate this kind of element of surprise and contestation within that that environment. The uh, the um, aleatory or the accidental um, aspect is the fact that the technology doesn't work perfectly. So I get really wonderful 
breaking uh, LED displays where the par part of it is moving and part of it is completely frozen. Part, come from, part comes from another ad than the other. And so I've been actually systematically photographing those things as a sort of like found art. But beyond that, so the, when I think about this Ralph Lauren project or the uh, almost simultaneous um, project by Calvin Klein when, when, uh, when he placed actually the uh, QR codes to be photographed with cell phones and then sort of like gaining that, that content which is impossible to display within the city space. I mean, that then, then I think these problems easily begin because of the nature of that space itself. So I think that this is an issue that I, I see as one of the key issues, thinking about the possibilities and impossibilities of uh, sort of like modifying and uh, that sort of like screen culture within public space. But I mean that what I wanted to ask about Giovanna is, is completely different. This may be a completely also obvious question, but it, I personally find it really interesting, uh, inspired by your presentation about the uh, Venus effect and its link w links with screen culture. And that's obviously is the question about selfies, you know. So the um, selfie, which I understand is now part of the Oxford English Dictionary as a new word, and and uh, of which we have seen so many, and actually really complex and multi-layered manifestations in a unusually short span of time. So mm -hmm. self is obviously a phenomenon uh, of screen culture that is, is actually um, asking for theoretical tools at the moment. So the, the main way of analyzing self is these days seems to be through data visualization, taking, taking big data sets and then dealing with massive numbers of images through sort of like computerized methods. But I just came to think, listening to your, your approach to that idea. So with the, with the kind of method that I see sort of like um, in seed in your presentation could be uh, a useful way of sort of like approaching and finding ways of making sense of the selfie. Uh, I'm also interested in this issue from a sort of like media archaeological point of view because selfie also has a media archaeological background and this has to do with the idea of um, uh, various types of screen practices and one of them would be, I, I just want to be brief, so the, the way how daguerreotype photographs, which is actually a mirror with an image, were used as pocket mirrors in the in the early 19th century. So the idea of superimposing representation and uh, presentation, and then the, the all the elements that come with, from the practice of actually holding and uh, turning the position of the mirror in your hand, which obviously has something to do with the with the practices that are now developing around the idea about the selfie itself. But but Giovanna, so what what do you think? So would would your approach potentially bring out something important and pro pot potentially unknown about the selfie phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So shall I go first? Uh, it's a very provocative question. I really love it. I think it's, I didn't think about it and I think it's, it's, very, um, it's very interesting and there's a fertile uh, frame, right, through which um, to think about the Venus effect. Um, so the selfies are a frame, are an existing typology that um, is new, but maybe is not that new, as you point out. Um, I would uh, respond there by appealing to actually uh, Derrida's uh, work on autobiography, and uh, both in relation to um, um, language, um, his work on Celan, for example, mm -hmm. and um, painting, uh, drawing, uh, as if, as in uh, Memories of the Blind, Memoirs of the Blind. I think that, you know, uh, autobiography is impossible. Mm -hmm. Autobiography and uh, cell portraits are um, uh, structurally delayed mm -hmm. and therefore entail a Venus effect, mm -hmm. because we are drawing ourselves at a delay from which we are 
actually drawing ourselves. We're taking a picture of ourselves at a moment that is already passed to some extent. So this idea of extemporaneity that cancels the, the delay is illusory. And so selfies are um, you know, the expression of a desire that is a desire for self-coincidence and self-presence that doesn't come to fruition. But I think that the Venus effect um, you know, is very powerful in them. We, we, we believe that self is our self is. And we believe that we are capturing ourselves as if in a mirror, right? And we attribute mirror capability to the, to the camera, which you tell me maybe has an archeological precedent to it. So thank you for the question, it's so very interesting. So the selfie also has actually these two aspects of, of presence and the sort of like, like, um, sort of like captured presence because I mean that it is it, it's I, I'm making a lot of observations like as a anthropologist of the screen culture mm -hmm. so the the idea that the selfie um, selfie kind of practice doesn't always need into lead into this snapping of the picture but it is is actually used as a mirror a lot of young Japanese young girls uh, don't use pocket mirrors any, anymore in the in the in the subway trains. <laughs> they see. use the use use I the see. mobile phone or the iPad for that purpose, but they don't necessarily snap it as a selfie. So this mm -hmm. this moment of snapping it or leaving it as a continuity of time for, uh, for a while, I think is an interesting aspect that could also for uh, profit from that kind of philosophical analysis. I would actually challenge you to write the first intelligent paper of the selfie. Applying the that your your theor theoretical construct that we just heard about with your blessing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> just a very short response on on the hacking yeah. issue. Uh, I I, yeah. I I do fully agree that there are wonderful incidences which we can observe, you know, in in LED panels when they actually fail and they create sort of sub narratives and that's that's wonderful. There's a media archaeological side to that. Um, for instance, graffiti artists deteriorating, deteriorating advertisement signs. You know, they, when they are transformed into something else, ambient media, sti ambient media stickers that have been removed and, and sort of deteriorate. So there's wonderful work in this area. One of my researchers has also done um, work on parkour, the sort of uh, m hacking through bodily movement into designed urban landscapes. That's all fine, and that's good, it's nice to be entertained by this, but I don't want to leave it to parkour artists and spray painters to decide over the shape of our future cities. I think that, that, that's what I'm trying to, to do with, um, with the work and the awareness that I'm trying to raise. Thanks. Thank you. another question from Marta. Well, first of all, thank you both for these really, really inspiring talks. Uh, I found both of them really flabbergasting, so thank you. Um, I have a question for you, Richard. Um, all of the things you showed us as examples made me think of one very simple and very hardly understandable word, magic. Now, this echoes in some way a uh, discussion we had with Vivian the other night. She said, somehow we live in a time in which magic has come back, in a way. Now, you showed us screens that, of course, make things appear, screens that make things disappear, and as you were talking about this um, with relation to architecture, I was thinking that like three weeks ago, I saw on the paper that, um, on the newspaper, that um, there is this um, company of designers who won an award for creating the first prototype of an airplane which completely disappears and you have the impression of flying in the clouds. So this just goes in the same direction. So things that appear, things that disappear, and screens that turn things into other things, say transform things into other things. 
And we do all experience this. Like, I wake up in the morning, I check my mail, then I scribble on my sketchbook, then I mm, i don't always have beautiful days like this, but I watch a movie, uh, then I turn on the, um, the fireplace, and I say turn on, really, not light, because it's still on my screen, and I listen to some music. You can get fireplace music on YouTube with fire and fire sound. Then I go to bed and I read a book and I realize that past, I spent my, old, my whole day just holding my iPad. So we kind of get used to this magic that technology allows us to experience. In a way, technology this way, I mean, by reali realizing screens that are so easy to use makes life look, feel a lot easier, makes things get a lot easier. But of course, this easy feeling hides a much more complex uh, universe. Now, what happens is that we run into a sort of dialectic of being familiar with technology and not knowing at all how it works. I mean, you showed the diagram, which was really interesting, uh, of the distance uh, with relation to the, the screen. It made me think cinema, it works with a projector, uh, we more or less know how a projector works. It's, it's a lot more difficult to get how the Google Glass Prism pattern screen works. So we, become, we become more and more familiar with the technology, but in fact, it is more and more mysterious to us. So this dialectic makes us behave in a way like tourists but go to the seaside, going to the seaside, and thinking that the sea is nice and beautiful and calm, and only people who are really into it, who were born there, they do really know what the danger of this beautiful water can be. So what do you think about this dialectic? And what do you think could be the consequences for the people being so familiar with things they do not know at all? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I could not possibly answer your question. I think there are so many things in it. We started out with the magic. Then. But I would say, let's start from, from the back. Just a few things that pop in my mind. I cannot predict the consequences, and I don't want to be a pessimist. I really want to be an optimist, but you have to be an optimist. Um, so I keep telling my, my students uh, this little anecdote, and I might have mention it to one of two of you today, but I, I, when I first started working in an office, uh, we had to, on a regular basis, send messages to people in other countries. The way we did this, that was in the 1980s, only in the 1980s, uh, we sent messages on, on long punch stripes, right? So I punched holes on a, on, on a strip and the telex machine then was standing next to me and I would feed a two, three, four, five meter long message into the telex machine. By the way, if I made a mistake, then I had to punch four holes into it to, to delete that mistake. It was awful. So there's something really, I mean, if you think about this system of sending a message with a machine like that, it's very, it was a very linear way of doing it as well. And I couldn't like recompose it. I had to do it on the fly. And then, oh gosh, how did I start a sentence? You could not even see what you have written, you know, because it wasn't a whole, incredible. So I was trained to send messages with this telex machine to other people. And I do remember the day in the office when we were standing around a so-called fax machine. And it was standing there and we were watching. Remember the, the, the thin thermal paper and the noise it made when it came out? It zzzzed, zzzzed, yeah? And then you were waiting for the transmission again and then it came out. And gradually a picture 
not a linear message, but actually a picture was appearing in front of my eyes. And I remember vividly we saying and said, wow, this is going to change the world. <laughs> that fax machine is the answer to everything. That fax machine is going to change absolutely everything. So my students obviously laugh at this. How is it possible that I'm already that old? Uh, <laughs> secondly, um, uh, what's so special about fax machines, and we can do all these things today, it's so ridiculous, we can send messages. But, so there is, I, I, I share your concern that I had the fortune to grow up in a time where I saw some of those, for me, seismic technological transformation with regards to image and communication technologies. And at the moment we are at a stage where we were raising these digital natives and my four-year-old daughter, you know, we heard about the control C function, she knows that as well. So how do you get this across? So I, I, I don't know, I would simply try to remind my students and, and, and people that it is not too long ago that we have left, left a very sequential way of communicating things and also a very sequential way of dealing with images and moving images and, and, and film. And that is totally blown out of the window. So that's that's, one aspect of it, it's, it's just an unatold, not an, not an answer. The other thing you raised is this point about um, sort of truth and authenticity, and that sort of brings me back to Benjamin and the you know, age of mechanical reproduction. And I have to say that when it comes to architecture, um, you know, those are readily available terms for us as architects and designers to use as well, but I think they are quite rapidly deteriorating as well, because uh, on the whole, um, we as consumers, also the consumers of spaces and architecture, uh, we don't seem to care very much about truth and honesty and truth and materiality or authenticity of architecture or style or heritage. We don't, we don't care about that. You just pick what you like. It's this individualized thing. It's not about sharing a common, uh, a common culture, common ground. I'll pick what I like. You know, I, I can live in a Greek house or I can live like in a house that looks like designed by Walter Gropius. It's not a problem. For me, it is a problem, but not for everybody else. So those terms that are deteriorating, there's, again, I have a few researchers who deal with this aspect, and it's fascinating to look into this, how, for instance, around the world, particularly in China, you have places popping up which are uh, copies of other places. So we're not talking about a fairground attraction, we're not talking about the Epcot Center or Disney World, we're talking about an Austrian village being reconstructed in, in the hills of China. Or uh, a third called, you're laughing, you have been there? No, I haven't, but yeah. I've seen <laughs> Or Thamestown near Shanghai, which is a uh, replica of several, a montage of several English towns merged together into a sort of a Frankensteinian village. You know, and that is, it, it's very, but we are, re a lot of us are readily adopting this and we think it's fine and it's probably just, you know, the times we, we live in, so I don't have an answer. On the magic side, I think within the magic, and film again obviously is a comfortable magical tradition, um, I would also say, I would connect this magic, uh, at least in architecture and design a little bit, with this notion of narratives as well, because I think, the narrative is where we as, 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 as designers and architects can engage the public quite well and also create uh, spaces that are probably um, uh, useful and at the same time fun and entertaining to, to, to inhabit and, and keep us occupied. Um, Vivian, you wanted to... Well, I'm sorry because I had introduced the issue of magic. And, and um, it was not so much, uh, I mean, we've always been at a stage, look, we turn on the lights. That's right. How many people really know how that works, you know? Uh, so we're always going to be in a state where um, our technology is going to appear uh, as magic when we first engage it, and then mm. when it becomes completely part of the furniture. Yeah. Uh, but the magic, I think, is more significant in terms of um, the issues that you raise have to do with um, really understanding the temporality and the spatial forms and the, the um, temporal 
forms that we experience with all of these changes uh, that, and, and I'm talking about magic, the notion in which process, which is partly in our relation to not knowing how things work and not even caring, it's just make it so, that the notion of, of process or duration in time or stability of space. Yeah. I mean, one of the things in the city mm. that's 3D mm. on 3D, mm. and we see it already with mm. people on the space of their cell phones, mm. um, of walking into mall fountains, and mm. uh, there are more pedestrian deaths. Mm. So, so the, the negotiation with the body in space mm -hmm. um, and in time, in, in terms of uh, there, we have limits, even if our technologies don't, uh, possibly, I mean, in terms of that fantasy. So the issue of magic for me is, is one in which there is this um, collapse of certain kinds of temporal processes, as well as we've now expanded spatial mm. possibilities. Uh, and, and it does have to do with the call for um, uh, dare I say, a, a very rich phenomenological uh, description mm -hmm. of <clears throat> the transformations because of the changed life world mm -hmm. of, of what space and time, what the shapes of it are relative to our own uh, capacities to negotiate it. Mm -hmm. So if I can just add, um, a, a little note on, on your question of uh, being so familiar with things we don't know. Um, I mean, this is the definition of Freud's uncanny, right, of Das Unheimliche. And I think um, uh, the technology that uh, we saw in these days and the Venus effect, which is the way in which I offer to interpret um, the way in which I see screens operating is also very uncanny. And so uh, I think that you, your question captures a, a feature of this experience, of these encounters um, that are profoundly uncanny. And I mean, magic, you know, magic is many things, first of all. But certainly uh, Freud um, in The Uncanny talks about uh, fables and um, uh, talks about the way in which fables in their very familiarity unleash that sense of uncanniness because the uncanny is a sense of distance and, and foreignness that can only erupt from the most familiar. So I think that your question captures a very intrinsic um, characteristics of both um, the evolution of, of screen experience and the Venus effect. Yeah. May I respond to this well? Because the, the, this sort of notion of uncanniness, obviously, is really relevant to, uh, to architecture as well. And what I find uh, interesting is that when I show the Samsung clip to some architectural students, they don't necessarily see any problem with it. They just see it, they're mesmerized by the music and you know, the beautiful imagery and they find it just, wow. Is visually very nice, but for them it's not uncanny at all. It's not uncanny at all that we see screens which can create 3D effects in, in within 3D environments. So to me, unfortunately, the question is really that we're losing this sense of because people believe me in mirrors. That's right. That's right. And yeah. the Venus effect, if indeed we would ha see a future in which um, you know screens would have cameras that look back is obviously applicable to, to architectural spaces and uh, as well with a lot of cameras already being mounted into our city spaces. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Il y a d'autres questions après? Il y aura d'autres questions? No? Well, okay. I I will just we have 10 minutes. Yeah, I will just add one word to this really interesting discussion about magic and media, and uh, that word is natural, so magia naturalis. So the mm -hmm. natural magic um, that uh, is a concept that uh, emerged with the Jesuits in the mm -hmm. 
in the 16th and 17th centuries and, and came, came profoundly to affect the early development of media culture that was, of course, famously picked up by David Brewster in the Letters on Natural Magic dedicated to Walter Scott in the, in the 18, 1830s. So the, the, the distinction made between natural magic and black magic uh, that the Jesuits first made, I think that came profoundly to sort of like um, inform. Basically this whole concept within this media culture, and this is exactly the issue that we encounter, let's say in the cultural special effects in, in, in the cinema. So this uncanny uh, related with media, I think always has to be probably filtered through this notion of, of natural magic, which is the certain kind of human-made magic, magic and these sort of like categories of um, experience that, uh, that have been developed within, within that concept, you know, that sort of like all these issues about suspension of, of disbelief and all those, those issues. And uh, I think that when we bring for Freud's, um, in the Freud's notion of the uncanny, so we, it is important and it is safe, makes sense to sort of like link that with this, this other strain of thinking about natural magic. Magia naturalis. Just a note. Yeah, go, go. I don't know. Yeah. Something like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, my, uh, it's very interesting, and uh, so I noticed that, uh, especially what Richard was talking about, very much related to what I've been doing as my research, because in Japan, I think it was uh, somewhere like uh, 2001 or 2002, what I recognized, observed, was this kind of communication between huge screens in Shibuya, for example, with the cell phones that people can send some information that appears on the screen. and so I was. Uh, because it was a time also the augmented reality, in Japan we usually call it mixed reality by then, uh, was just kind of becoming, uh, how to say, uh, usable. So I was very much interested in kind of how these kind of screens and also the size and the relation to the body is related to their sense of reality people feel uh, within this kind of image in the screen. So that was very interesting. But so my, my question is related to the previous questions. So I think that the, uh, the invisible building, uh, I think it's, isn't it that the tower in Korea, in Seoul, near the airport? Yeah, it was proposed, I think, yeah. of course you know, I guess, the uh, proposed one year ago or so. The, so um, there's a plan to build a very high skyscraper in Seoul, in suburban Seoul, not far from the airport. And the idea is to make that building transparent during the daytime. The, Technology itself is, in a way, simple and understandable, so that the, uh, the, all the tower, the surface of the tower will be covered by the display. And it's possible because now these kind of big LED screens are possible, not projecting, but you know, that kind of screens. And the uh, cameras will be uh, installed on each side, and the image captured, captured by one camera would be shown on the other side. So the landscape to be seen on the other side, so that makes the uh, uh, building transparent. And as far as that, what I had read, maybe something like uh, one year ago, a half year ago or so, so they were not quite sure it would be accepted because it's near the airport. <laughs> so what if the airplane pilots cannot see the, the tower? But anyway, so um, my question is, so, I have a feeling like the uh, recently was already gone for 10 years or 20 years, like in case of Japanese architect Toyo Ito, to make the uh, architecture sort of flamboyant, so invisible, light-weighted, uh, has become a kind of the sort of the uh, interest among some architects. I, I, I'm not an uh, architect, so, so I, I, I might be wrong. And on the other hand, so, this uh, kind of making the uh, architecture sort of invisible so, or not annoying the landscape kind of things is one thing that we see. The, on the other hand, so the, uh, there was this uh, discussion about graffiti and those activists uh, make the graffiti by light. 
like uh, the, uh, those people, the artists who do the eye writer thing in America. So the, the huge uh, buildings, the business buildings, which are darkened during the night and they, they do the graffiti. So how, what do you think the, uh, from the uh, point, point of view of the architects? So why people make the architects may, want to make the uh, architects, the, uh, the building invisible? And what does it mean to make them visible by kind of graffiti uh, with those activists? So I would uh, profoundly disagree that a majority of architects would like to make their buildings invisible. No, no, no not not majority, <laughs> but some of them. It's um, you know, uh, I have to sort of bite my tongue really here because we are on a live stream, um, but <laughs> but I I just find it. This sort of idea that you can build a skyscraper and then make it disappear is to me um, crafted as part of a marketing campaign or to get funding for a project or to uh, excite a city council or, 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 or businessmen who would like to invest in two lofts and apartments. To me, there's very little sense into it and, and, unless there is some political reason why we suddenly have to create camouflage architecture. It just doesn't make sense. It co goes against everything that I think architecture is and, and isn't. Um, you know, I, I just, I mean, Presence and absence has always been terms which are used by, by architecture and, and lightness and, and the Tower of Winds and Toyo Ito's other work to make buildings float or, or lightweight. That overcoming gravity, for instance, yeah, th those are terms that I think are, are, um, are used by architecture. But I think the disappearance of buildings is, is another one. It touches, but I think it crosses the line, the notion of representation in architecture. What, is, what role has architecture to play with regards to representation? And that role has been changing since the, since the Renaissance, obviously. And I think in the 20th century and now the 21st century, there's a re-evaluation re of what, who's responsible for the representation of buildings. And, um, and, and you know, who are we shaping representation for? Who are the consumers of these representations? I'm critical of this notion of representation. I know a number of wonderful architects who, who you know, in the 1950s already, people like Alvaro Cesar, for instance, made very distinctly unrepresentational buildings, buildings that didn't try to pretend, buildings that weren't try to sort of uh, be authoritative or portray something else. They simply concentrated on the creation of space. And to think about buildings more from the inside out than from the outside in is something you know, where um, you know, Hans Scharoun and, and, and other key architects in the 20th century readily uh, dwelled on. Uh, so I think we're overshooting the, the, the target immensely to think about making buildings uh, disappear. To me, this is, unfortunately, despite this being a, a uh, a live stream, uh, more a marketing gimmick than uh, a serious architectural proposition. I wouldn't see a sense in, in it. Thank you. That's time for last uh, question, Matthias. Oh, Anna. I, I just wanted to say, yeah, actually, that's what I was thinking also. That's why I, I, I talked about the graffiti artist as a kind mm -hmm. of contrast. And also, mm -hmm. the, uh, actually, the reason why I asked the question is now the screens are used, huge screens are used to uh, make this kind of camouflage or whatever, mm -hmm. the screens. That's mm -hmm. I didn't want to catch. <laughs> I could make, uh, can I, uh, we're running out of time, but I, if you're interested, if anybody's interested in this topic, I wrote an article about how Liverpool dealt with making buildings invisible through an inverse process. Instead of making them invisible, they made them highly visible and as such invisible. So they used very bright, colorful screens uh, with distinct set of messages on it, but they were hiding the buildings behind it. And, and th that, I think, I find much more intriguing to actually hide something by making it more visible. Mathias? Moi, je vais, je vais parler en, en français parce que mon anglais n'est pas très bon. Et puis, euh, je m'excuse un peu aussi parce qu'il se peut que je n'ai pas tout saisi dans votre euh, intervention en anglais, notamment pour des questions de vocabulaire, mais j'ai une question qui concerne un peu la la journée dans son ensemble, entre la première et la seconde partie, sur la, la question de l'écran, parce qu'on avait, par exemple, en première partie, enfin, dans la première partie, une vision assez pessimiste de la part de Bernard Stiegler sur euh, l'effet que pouvaient avoir les, les écrans. Et votre, dans votre présentation, vous nous avez... Euh, enfin, vous, vous positionnez sur une position plutôt optimiste. 
avec, euh, et notamment en présentant tous les aspects extraordinaires de ce que pouvaient euh, apporter la, euh, les écrans, notamment, enfin là, je ne sais pas si j'ai très bien compris, notamment sur la capacité à faire disparaître euh, euh, des, des bâtiments. Et moi, je, euh, je me pose la question, mais ce n'est pas très clair parce que ça commence à, à se mettre en route, savoir si c'est... Euh, comment dire euh, Oui, parce qu'en fait, je n'ai pas cessé de penser à, tout au long de la journée à un texte de, de Walter Benjamin qui s'appelle « Le pouvoir d'imitation euh, »« Das mimitische Vermögen » dans lequel... Euh, enfin, Excusez-moi, je, je crois que ma, ma question n'est pas encore euh, très claire dans ma tête pour être euh, formulée, mais euh, parce que en fait, si, si je fais référence à ce texte, c'est qu'il me semble... Euh, prendre les deux, enfin, en main les, les deux aspects de, que j'ai soulevés sur l'optimisme ou le pessimisme, de, de, notamment vis-à-vis -vis de l'écran, euh, où lui, il, il thématise la question de la perte de l'aura, et en, 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 théma, enfin, comment dire, en théorisant une forme de continuité, puisqu'il explique que, par exemple, la, la reproductivité technique est un rudiment de cette faculté originaire d'imitation, euh, ça c'est le premier aspect et que donc il y aurait que, que finalement en fait tout, tout cet aspect de, de rendre invisible un, un immeuble c'est pas si extraordinaire que ça et que tout, tout a été enfin il a toujours été question de visible et d'invisible et donc de, de savoir dans, dans quelle mesure l'écran lui-même euh, euh, transforme ce jeu de visibilité et, euh, et ça c'était le premier aspect enfin, enfin bon voilà je suis un peu désolé d'avoir pris la parole parce que j'avais une question qui, qui s'est perdue en cours de route, euh, je suis désolé. Yes. Oui, um, well, I, I think this is perhaps where also I have I agreed with a lot of things of um, Bernard's presentation this morning. I, I think in the, in the one aspect I, I would like to differ is that I wouldn't want to take a pessimistic and a slightly defeatist position and simply describe a situation and then not offer uh, a, a possible scenario uh, to engage with it. And I think this is perhaps me being a, a designer. And I think um, we also heard this morning that you know, as a designer within the disciplines, you're more more or less in, in, enslaved in this in the system. You you serve the system, and I I wouldn't like to believe that. At least uh, that's not the sort of practice that I'm trying. <coughs> to work in myself and I'm trying to engage uh, my, my researchers in it, for instance. Very, in very particular terms, for instance, with regards to urban screens, I'm at the moment trying to uh, attract funding uh, to work with one of the largest marketing agencies uh, in, in the world to work on very sensitive issues with regards to how uh, marketing is conducted in urban environments and how they engage with people, because there are lots of ethical questions to be asked, if you ask me, it's very political, it's about identification, it's about the, the shaping of individualized content, who gets what content, and, and, and so forth. And rather than saying, well, this is just um, uh, all very bad, I think it's important that we engage with, uh, uh, with these agencies uh, in a creative way, and I believe that uh, creative solutions can be found, uh, which actually would um, probably lead to a possible scenario in which urban environments indeed are improved and have an increased quality of life. Not everything is pessimistic. I think it's relatively easy to have a pessimistic position, but it's more difficult to see through that and see actually the opportunities in it and see how it could serve society at large. And that's really what I'm uh, hoping to, to, to argue and, and hoping to, to work on in the future. Um, on, uh, yeah, I think that's so far. Yeah, if I can just add a word, I really like my co-speaker's choice of words here. The idea of engagement, right? Yeah. So pessimism, optimism, I mean, these are judgments. These are uh, large generalizations. I think that engagement with the present is fundamental. It's fundamental for politics, for social understanding, for philosophy and theory in general. 
And I, concerning Benjamin, so I really like the idea of finding a way to engage the present, you know, however it is, however it comes. I mean, mm -hmm. we have no choice on what we get, um, but we have a choice on how we respond to it. Uh, Concerning Benjamin, I think that um, the way, you know, there are many ways to read Benjamin. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the question of the aura and imitation, uh, it's very complex. And um, uh, I think that Benjamin leaves it very indeterminate, actually, at least in my reading. I think that, um, uh, you know, uh, his appreciation of the aura of authenticity of this sacred space that the object itself uh, used to occupy and possibly doesn't anymore, but that still radiates, um, is very indeterminate. So I don't know, you look like you are having the question now. Oui, oui, ça, ça, ça se précise. Ça revient? Oui, ça, ça se précise un peu, mais c'est. C'est parce que dans toutes les interventions, enfin, j'ai cru comprendre que l'écran intervenait aussi comme une forme de, de rupture, ouvrant de nouvelles possibilités. Mm -hmm. Puisque, Monsieur mm -hmm. euh, Coeg, vous avez dit par exemple que l'écran est plus qu'un dispositif optique. En, à un moment donné, en disant que peut-être Mauro serait... qui, qui, qui dépasse... Euh, et, et dans une forme, quand je parlais d'optimisme, c'est plus une, un, un sens. C'est-à-dire, par exemple, Bernard Stiegler, lui, il, il disait aussi que l'écran opère une rupture, mais plus dans un sens, et il mettait en avant les, les, aspects, euh, les aspects néfastes. C'est ça que je nommais par, par pessimisme. Et en fait, ce que j'essaie de comprendre, enfin, c'est plus une question de compréhension, c'est essayer de situer où est vraiment la, 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 la mutation euh, opérée par l'écran dans, dans le régime de visibilité, d'une part, et dans le régime aussi de, de subjectivation. Et, et le, 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 si j'évoquais... Euh, Benjamin, c'est parce que, euh, et notamment la question de, de Laura, dans, dans ce texte du pouvoir d'imitation, où il part depuis le, le, le pouvoir originaire de, depuis le, oui, les origines, le pouvoir originaire d'imitation d'une population fantasmée avant le langage, en prenant aussi l'exemple de l'enfant, qui, qui est revenu aussi dans le, dans le, dans le, dans le, le discours de, de Bernard Stiegler, en en montrant que euh, la révolution technique avait d'un certain, certain côté entraîné une perte de ce pouvoir d'imitation, avait transformé notre rapport aux, aux choses, mais gardait aussi un, euh, certains aspects, certains restes de, de, de ce pouvoir d'imitation. Et donc, euh, alors je ne sais pas si je suis enfin, si j'arrive à clarifier un peu mon, ma question. Mais c'était vraiment, c'est plus une question générale, de, de savoir euh, où vraiment, euh, quelle mutation euh, opère le, enfin, voilà, quelle mutation opère l'écran. Et euh, mais voilà, peut-être que je n'arrive pas à, à, à vraiment être très précis sur, sur ma question, en fait. Uh, I, I cannot fully answer your, your question, but just a very small fragment I'll, I'll pick out with regards to the, to the window and the sort of notion of the window being a world through which we look at something and, and, and otherness. And I think what, what screen technology is, is, is providing us is potentially a, a possibility to some extent, you know, climb into that window and actually be in charge of creating whatever is within that window. Um, so. Um, that is, I think, the, uh, uh, an opportunity for engagement that we can, that will sort of reverse the, the case once again, in the sense that, yes, we are being looked at and we are going to be ma made part of a optical system, whether it is through surveillance cameras in cities or through so, to, uh, 3D environments or through computer gaming. But what is the role that we are playing in this system? Is it one that is passively, of, is it one that is a, of a passive consumer or is it one of an active uh, participant or somebody who actually shapes that uh, system. And I think here are, uh, for me at least, opportunities and I could envision scenarios in which quite useful and uh, intriguing scenarios where we, through our bodily actions, can 
find a synthesis between screen studies and architectural physical space that truly improves uh, our everyday lives. If I can touch, um, you know, uh, any wall and, uh, and, 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 and use this for wall as a surface to provide me some information from, for instance, or a um, project that I actually work on, it, which is uh, using mobile technologies to stitch information in space, which other people then can retrieve and add to um, that information. Um, I think that there are exciting opportunities to, to shape that that window that we, we inhabit. Sorry, that was just a, a fraction of what you, what you asked. Well, and I would uh, just say that um, my talk kind of warned against reading screens under um, the aegis of imitation, right? And so your reference to Benjamin and reproducibility, uh, I, I, we might have different readings of Benjamin and I think there is space for uh, different readings, but um, uh, if imitation means, uh, you know, mimesis, to court, right? I'm not sure that we should uh, interpret um, screens under sort of a, um, a tout court um, understanding of mimesis, of imitation. You know, it, the Venus effect and the, the, the four um, poles of that exchange that I sort of uh, paradigmatically gave you with the three paintings speak to that. And um, so I, I, I think it would be a mistake to think of, uh, and we, as every we expect them yeah. to be mirrors, yeah. but they're not. I, th I think we, we don't see them as imitations either. I mean, the general public right. wouldn't see that as imitation. I wouldn't question a piece of moving image and say, oh, well, this is an imitation of New York. No, it isn't. That, to me, is New York, you know. Or, you know that actually, that mechanical reproduction informs my understanding of what New York actually is for me. Et donc, je vous remercie encore une fois. Euh, on a largement dépassé les temps, donc je crois que on pourrait terminer ici la session de l'après-midi. Je remercie encore une fois beaucoup Giovanna Boradori et Richard Cook pour leurs interventions engagées. J'ai vu que cet engagement, vous le partagez, c'est qui nous rend très heureux parce que malgré la longue journée, c'était vraiment très stimulant de parler avec vous tous.